Hello, I'm Hannah Donnert with the Collaborative on Health and the Environment. She enjoys bringing you the latest environmental health science through our partnership calls, webinars, science serfs, publications, and social media. I would like to welcome everyone to today's partnership webinar, which is titled Improving Health Outcomes at the Community Level, Chemical Risk Assessment Methods in Light of Lessons Learned with COVID-19. Our moderator today is Kara Dwin Foley, MPH candidate in the environmental health environmental health at Boston University School of Public Health and communications analyst at the Office of Technical Assistance in the Massachusetts Executive Office of Energy and Environmental Affairs. We will leave time following the presentation for a brief Q&A session. You may type in questions through the Q&A feature available on the menu bar at the top of your window at any point during the presentation. After the presentations, our moderator will read out questions for our presenters to respond to. We'll get to as many comments and questions as we can during the Q&A period. For those of you who called in on the phone, we've posted slides to accompany today's webinar on our website. You can download these by going to healthandenvironment.org. Please scroll to the bottom of the page and select today's webinar. On the webinar page is a link to the slides. Tomorrow, we will also send you an email with a link to a survey. Please consider taking a few minutes to fill it out and let us know what you think of our webinar. Everyone on the webinar right now is muted with the exception of our moderator and our speakers. This webinar is scheduled to last for 60 minutes and is being recorded for our call and webinar archive. With that, I'll turn things over to you, Kara Dwin. All right, thank you very much, Hannah. So welcome everyone to today's webinar. We're very excited to have you with us today to talk about a very important topic. This webinar is hosted by the BU, the Boston University Superfund Research Program and the Collaborative on Health and the Environment. And the National Institute of Environmental Health Science funds the Superfund Research Program which is a multidisciplinary program with centers all over the country. Each center conducts and communicates research with the goal of breaking the link between environmental exposures and disease. And research translation and community engagement are core elements of the Superfund Research Program. So today's discussion will very much engage with those topics. So right now, environmental justice communities are facing a new catastrophe in the form of the COVID-19 pandemic. Serious complications of COVID are more common in people who have certain other health conditions as well, such as diabetes, and many of these conditions are more prevalent among people of color. But we can't decouple that from the structural racism that operates in these communities in countless intersecting ways, including through segregation, forced assimilation practices, the isolation of non-English language speakers, economic privation, uh, the denigration of traditional practices and traditional knowledge and many, many others. And in environmental health, we often lean on the traditional EPA paradigm for environmental risk assessment, which overlooks many of these factors and indeed can even act, exacerbate some of them. So our speakers today are going to discuss the limitations of that traditional risk assessment framework when it comes to responding to the needs of environmental justice communities and how this framework can and must evolve to serve these communities in an equitable way. And in particular, they're gonna be addressing a tribal nation's perspective and talk about current endeavors to integrate tribal voices and conceptions of health into environmental risk assessment work. So I'd like to introduce our speakers on this call. Uh, their full bios are available on the CHE website, but briefly, uh, first we will be hearing from Dr. Wendy Heiger-Bernays from the Department of Environmental Health at the BU School of Public Health. Uh, she is the PI of the Research Translation Corps of BU's Superfund Research Program. And Dr. Heiger Bernays has spent most of her career focused on the implications of toxicology on regulatory decision making and its impacts at the community level. Second, we'll hear from Dr. Molly Kyle, uh, an epidemiologist at Oregon State University who leads the Environmental Exposure and Biomarker Lab who has spent much of her career focusing on community-based environmental health research. Dr. Kyle heads the Community Engagement Core for the Oregon State Superfund Research Program. And along with Dr. Kyle, we'll be hearing from Sadell Harrison, MPH, a graduate student at Oregon State, who's working on public health research translation efforts, specifically concentrating on work with tribal nations, uh, and currently with the Confederated Tribes of the Umatilla Indian Reservation. So let me hand things over first to Dr. Heiger Bernays to get us started. Thank you, Karen Wynn. Uh, good afternoon from the East Coast of the United States. 
Thank you to the organizers, Maria Valenti, with whom the BU SRP has worked for at least 10 years. She's tireless in her efforts to use the science to improve the public's health, particularly around toxic chemicals. To Hannah at Che for making this work and to my colleagues, Molly Kyle and her student, Sadell Harrison and my student, Caridwin Foley. Here we are in the middle of a pandemic with a new administration on deck, many chemicals in the queue for assessment and lots of excellent science and data, including that which communities and scientists have long recognized. People are not exposed to single chemicals or single stressors at one time. In fact, in 2016, NIEHS called for prioritizing mixtures assessment and early on, EPA also recognized the challenges of mixtures assessment and sought to begin to address this. This was years ago. The National Academy of Sciences, those experts who gather to untangle really hard technical and societal problems have implored us to improve the way we do risk assessment. In fact, the last time was 12 years ago with this document called Science and Decisions. But what does this have to do with COVID-19? As Caridwin mentioned, there is a connection. Public health never gets attention when things are even sort of working. Well, nothing's working. COVID-19 has laid bare these facts. The rates of illness, death, heartbreak, and economic disaster have hit marginalized people hardest. We hear about the quote unquote, underlying conditions that make people more susceptible to the effects and severity of this virus. For every statistic, there is a person, a family, a community whose lives have been devastated. We in environmental public health know that there has long been well-documented environmental injustices and COVID has both exacerbated these and shown a spotlight on them. As Caridwin mentioned, marginalized people have been exposed to toxic chemicals by virtue of where they live and work. For example, the location of our hazardous waste sites, our Superfund sites, industrial sources of chemicals and disposal locations is overwhelming, overwhelmingly located uh, in communities that can't bear these. Let's take a look at the tool that is used to inform decisions about the placement, the allowable levels, and administrative controls on hazardous chemicals in our country. First, happy birthday, EPA. It's 50 years last week. The work that has been done on our improving the quality of our air and our water regulation of pesticides has significantly improved the health of the many people in this country but the recognition that many people are not protected from the effects of environmental contamination was the basis for President Clinton's executive order of 1994, requiring environmental justice considerations in all federal actions, including the methods used to evaluate and assess health risks due to toxic chemical exposures. Today, Without going into the politics, we have the Environmental Justice 2020 Action Agenda. In practice, this agenda falls short. It isn't leveraging the work of the National Academies, the work of communities, nor the work of scientists. Today, we focus on the major tool used to make decisions about communities, their exposures to toxic chemicals, and we make some strong recommendations for improving the tool. Here we are, risk assessment. It is a tool, as I tell my students, it is simply a tool. It provides a framework and an approach that was codified in the early days of EPA. It's, a use, it's useful for dis making decisions about pollution prevention, which chemicals, for example, should not be in commerce, and administrative controls for those chemicals that are already on our land, in our water, in our food and air. For example, how much of the polychlorinated biphenyl contaminated sediment needs to be removed from New Bedford Harbor, the largest marine Superfund site in the US. The tool is also used to answer questions, for example, about eating fish 
caught in New Bedford Harbor. In fact, the administrative controls in New Bedford Harbor not only include a fish consumption advisory that was developed using a risk assessment, but also includes a complete ban on fishing in the harbor. So our tool, we start with the hazard assessment right up here. This is where the available scientific data for a chemical or perhaps a group of chemicals is evaluated to document the weight of evidence that there is a link between the negative effects of the chemical on health. Some toxicologists seek to establish the entire mechanism by which the chemical interacts with cellular molecules before considering that there is sufficient evidence to regulate a chemical. This will only result in delaying regulation of that chemical and that's for another day. For site-specific risk assessments, this is also where the data on the concentrations of the chemical in the water, the fish, the air, et cetera, are compiled where chemicals of concern are identified. It is those chemicals that get carried through the risk assessment. But let's focus on the other, two other key components, the exposure assessment and the dose response assessment with an eye towards the accumulated science of the past 30 years and the realities of communities impacted by toxic chemicals. The exposure assessment describes who is exposed and, and to how much of the chemicals or other stressors. Historically, the risk assessor focused on the most exposed individual. And over time, the assessment procedure moved to assessment of an average population or perhaps an upper percentile of the population who may be exposed to the chemicals. By way of example, consumption of fish caught in New Bedford Harbor Assumptions were made about who is consuming, how much fish, the frequency with which the fish is consumed, and these values were plugged into the risk assessment to determine how much fish was determined to be safe to consume. But here's the rub. Never was inhalation of PCBs from air around the harbor considered, nor were any other non-New Bedford Harbor exposures to PCBs for example, from other sources, nor were any other chemical or non-chemical exposures considered. Likewise, the assessment was originally done using assumptions about consumption from national surveys, not from the actual community engaging in these activities, nor the priorities they may place on the activity. Shown here is a link to the most recent EPA guidelines from 20, actually 2019 for doing the exposure assessment, which involves, includes engaging the community and listening to their health concerns. We have evolved. We have an improved exposure assessment methodology, still needs work, but Molly will discuss that later. The other key element of the risk assessment is the dose response section. This is where the key adverse effects or disease outcomes, whether they be liver disease, immune system suppression, reproductive effects, cancers, neurobehavioral effects, developmental effects, are documented for each individual chemical under assessment. The dose response assessment defines the dose where the effects should not occur. The data used to derive these doses is based almost entirely on toxicological data from animal studies, sprinkling of epidemiological data, and in some cases, some in vitro uh, study data. Key here is that the health effect is determined as a single adverse condition, and it is done so for one chemical or a small mixture of like, of like chemicals at a time. Once the adverse effect is defined, doses are modeled, as you can see here, doses are modeled from the data and most commonly, they are then modified with a series of factors, numbers, to account for differences in physiology, typically between rodents and susceptible humans. And that output is called the reference dose, again, the reference dose is the dose of the chemical to which people can be exposed on a daily basis without expected adverse health outcomes, specifically the outcome defined by that assessment. 
While the exposure assessment process has been significantly improved since its inception in the early days of EPA, we posit that the dose response assessment unfortunately remains back in the day. The dose response metric needs to incorporate the data from epidemiology and from public health science. Data strongly suggests that exposure to toxic substances increases the vulnerability and disease burden. So when a chemical affects the physiology, this can make people more susceptible to other insults. Severity of COVID-19 is greatest in people with underlying disease. This we know, but we don't develop the dose response assessment for anyone but those with no underlying health conditions. We could do this by considering the background, perhaps a clinical vulnerability distribution where we could assume chemical, perhaps additivity to background disease or the, even the aging process, which gets us to what is health? The health outcome, what is health? Should it continue to be one adverse effect for each chemical in a background of no other exposures or health conditions? We believe we need to consider a more complete definition of health versus adverse outcome. This is a term that ignores the public health and other clinical findings. And finally, the National Academies have been clear. We need to use all of the data. We need our dose response values to reflect the variability in population's response and the uncertainty in those data. In fact, the EPA recognized this in a publication back in 2014. The final step in the risk assessment is the risk characterization, which combines exposure and dose response. And again, we typically examine one chemical at a time. When we assess risk to chemicals that affect the health of organ systems, we are only able to make statements about whether the exposure is above or below that acceptable dose. No subtlety, no consideration of slightly below the acceptable dose, leaving decision makers in a tough spot. Situations aren't red or green. The implication of a risk assessment can be significant in the lives of community members. But before I hand this off to Molly and Sidel, I leave you with some key points. But the bottom line is that we need to improve this tool. I've provided some recommendations and we have an opportunity now. Let's move risk assessment into the 21st century and not get bogged down in the desire to understand the mechanism of how every chemical works before we regulate it. We must stop looking under the lamppost and start asking some hard questions. And I will turn it over to Molly. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Hayer Benet. Oh. Um, while we're waiting for um, Molly to pull up her slides, I just wanna remind everyone um, to feel free to put in your questions in the Q&A box. And we'll get to those as soon as we can after their second speaker, or two, two speakers next. So thank you very much uh, for inviting us to participate in the Collaborative on Health and the Environment webinar series. Over the years, many people have discussed and worked to, as Wendy says, putting the health in human health risk assessment. And we're honored to have this opportunity to contribute our perspective on how to incorporate indigenous health into this decision-making framework. My name is Molly Kyle, and I direct the Community Engagement Corps of the Oregon State University Pacific Northwest National Laboratory Superfund uh, center. The title of our community engagement core is reducing toxic exposures and improving community health with university and tribal partnerships. And this title really foreshadows the overall theme of our talk. The central mission of our core is to develop scientific and cultural capacity within our university and our partnering communities that have impacted, been impacted by hazardous substances and to use community engaged methodologies to develop risk reduction strategies that can empower people to participate in decisions that improve their community's health. As a brief order of business, I would like to allow, uh, let you all know that our presentation will be shared equally between myself and Sidel, which is a common indigenous research practice and illustrates the contributions of each of our expertise. So Sidel, do you wanna introduce yourself? Good morning. Yes. Uh, hi, my name is Sadell Harrison. 
Um, I am from the Cayuse, Walla Walla, and Yakima nations in the Pacific Northwest. I'm a third year doctoral student in health promotion and health behavior here at OSU. And I have worked with Molly in the Superfund Research Program's uh, Community Engagement Corps for going on about five years. And I'm very happy to be here. So looking forward to chatting at the end of our presentation. <clears throat> so let me advance the slides here. Uh, our presentation is really kind of divided into three parts. Since the theme of this webinar includes lessons learned with COVID-19, which includes, which includes an increased national awareness of systemic racial inequalities. We wanted to start by briefly discussing the health and environmental inequities that have been experienced by tribal nations. We'll then move on to discussing chemical risk analysis and risk management methodology and uh, how it needs to continue to evolve to address indigenous knowledge and indigenous health. And then we will end by discussing some steps that can be taken by organizations that can strengthen partnerships between universities and tribal nations and improve the risk assessment process and ultimately improve indigenous health. Steps that are generalizable to other organizations and community partners. Okay, um, because we were asked to talk about the, or the topic was disproportionate impacts of COVID-19, it's, um, it's a relevant time for us to talk about the longstanding root causes. Um, so bear with me as I give you a little bit of history. So Treaty of the United States, <clears throat> treaties of the United States provide unique sovereign authority to tribal nations by forcing the exchange of tribal homelands for a formal agreement backed by the constitution that the United States recognize tribes as separate nations within a nation and are afforded services under the federal government. Since the treaty signing era, the government of the United States has failed to and actively evaded treaty obligations to tribal treaty signing nations. <clears throat> Genocidal policies forced removal of indigenous Americans from tribal lands to reservations and eroded traditional practices that maintained health, prevented cultural connectedness and fam familial bonds. The agenda to divide, assimilate, and destroy the Indian way of life continued through the last century by way of termination and relocation policy, which terminated the federal government's responsibilities to tribes and forced thousands of American Indian and Alaska Native people to urban relocation and assimilation sites. The boarding school era continued the assimilation practices by forcibly removing children from American Indian and Alaska Native homes to attend boarding schools where children were reformed into replicas of white settlers, language banned and assimilation curriculum enforced. Further, the extension of this childhood trauma played out in, in the foster system where estimates suggest upwards of 35% of children were removed without due cause from native households and placed with non-native foster families. Remnants of these policies endure in the socio-environmental division of American Indian populations by arbitrary geopolitical boundaries known as federal Indian reservations. The Bureau of Indian Affairs reports approximately 65.2 million acres of land are held in trust by the United States under 326 land areas deemed federal Indian reservations. And it is no mystery to tribal people what the root causes are of the disproportionate levels of negative health outcomes like what we're seeing in the COVID-19 pandemic. Next slide, Molly. The tribal nations have also experienced a long history of environmental injustice. This image was produced by Tristan Campbell, who created a story map called Pollution in Indian Country. And, the, and he basically mapped the location of federal Indian reservations and EPA listed Superfund sites. These Superfund sites are recognized by the EPA as areas that have been contaminated by hazardous waste that has been dumped, left out in the open, or otherwise improperly managed and as such pose a risk to the health of the environment and the people who rely on those environmental services. The EPA has the authority and the responsibility for remediating these hazardous waste sites to a level that will protect human health and the environment. Cleaning up Superfund sites is a complex undertaking that includes multiple phases and has the ultimate goal of making sure that the cleanup is consistent with likely future uses of a site. Consideration of reuse of a site 
can occur at any point in the Superfund cleanup process, from site investigation activities to its ultimate deletion from the national priority list. And the EPA is mandated to work with communities to make sure that the sites or the portions of the sites are used safely. What's important to recognize is that of the 1,344 listed Superfund sites in the contiguous United States, 13% have a federal Indian reservation located within a 10 mile radius. These hazardous waste sites exist with tribal, within the tribal, usual, and accustomed lands, lands that were negotiated in federal treaties and that tribal members were guaranteed access to and perpetuate to gather their traditional foods, medicines, and natural materials that support their lives and cultural practices. So what you see in this map is that there are 152 federal Indian reservations, which are often comprised of several tribes that have hazardous wastes on their lands. And this number would be greater if you extended this map into Alaska and Hawaii and the territories of the United States, such as Puerto Rico and Guam or even if you included other hazardous waste sites, such as the Department of Defense formerly used defense sites, which includes Hanford, uh, which is a nuclear uh, waste facility where the Manhattan Project happened, which uh, is located on Siddell's lands. So this is really an underestimate of the tribal populations that are at risk. Furthermore, biological monitoring studies often report that Native Americans and Alaska Natives have higher body burdens of toxic chemicals compared to their non-native contemporaries. All of this is illustrating the disproportionate impact of toxic chemicals on tribal communities. And it's important to recognize that each of these tribal nations is unique with their own culture and their own relationship to their lands. And that they're also sovereign nations, meaning that each tribe will govern their own affairs, they will have their own agencies and promote tribal culture and well-being. And as sovereign nations, they will maintain a government-to-government -government relationship with the EPA and other institutions. So American Indians and Alaska Natives and other indigenous peoples are intimately connected to a particular place and the desire for stewardship over the wellness of the place, because the social norm is that the place is vital to the people's health and wellness. This is a common understanding in public health. For example, the social ecological model highlights five levels of socio-environmental influence on health, the intrapersonal, interpersonal, community, organizational, and policy. Where native values and beliefs acknowledge different or non-indigenous or Western science value systems, they can maneuver between systems. The more rigid, rigid Western science system cannot or will not. For natives, traditional knowledge systems in Western science are different, but equally true and valuable in context. The flexibility is vital to communities and cultures engulfed by the unrelenting forces of dominant cultures. Resurgence among indigenous groups of North American Indians uh, and Alaska natives to a post-colonial return to indigenous culture or cultural orientation and practice using established points of culture serves as the most promising avenue for addressing health disparities internally and improving lives of indigenous populations. And I've just shown here a very um, <clears throat> personal uh, depiction of our plateau tribe seasonal rounds. So you can see the months on the outside and how the, um, the, the interworkings, our traditional knowledge is tied to the food that we eat. And the plate in the background is how we honor our food at our traditional ceremonies inside our longhouse. And you can see that that coincides pretty well with, uh, with the circle, circle. So that's how the food is served. That's how it's honored in order. And order is very important. So connection to the land and, and health of the land that provides those foods in order is very important. And that is sort of the intra and interpersonal level where you look on the left side. And that's just an example of the first foods upland vision where this has carried up into policy within our tribe for the vision to ensure healthy, resilient and dynamic upland ecosystems capable of providing first foods that sustain the, con the continuity um, of the tribe's culture. So that's just an example. Next slide, Molly. So moving into the second part of our presentation, we wanna discuss the evolution of chemical risk analysis and risk management methodology through a more indigenous lens. 
So Wendy outlined the risk assessment process that's used by federal agencies, which is what you can see here as well. And it really does provide a framework for incorporating toxicology into environmental decision making. Historically, the Red Book Risk Assessment Framework, the firewall between the risk assessment process and the risk management decision making, which includes those engineering and administrative remedies that are designed to reduce exposure to the identified chemical hazards. And the idea being that these remedies would reduce people's exposures to toxic chemicals in the air, water, soil, and food, and subsequently reduce the associated cancer and non-cancer health risks proportionally. But what I want to point out is that this firewall between risk assessment and risk management. And while the original reasoning for the separation was that it would preserve the scientific impartiality of the risk analysis by separating it from the economic realities of the decision making that would need to be made to manage the risks that were identified, this separation really kind of had an unintended effect of excluding stakeholders, such as tribal nations, who could help to identify hazards, develop priorities, and guide the selection of remedies that would help to return these sites to productive uses, which is the ultimate goal of the Superfund cleanup process. And as for tribes, the productive uses of these sites are the ability to use these areas as their traditional customs dictate, namely for gathering food, natural materials, medicines, and their cultural practices. As the field of risk assessment advanced with that uh, silver book that Wendy mentioned, and it came along, this firewall began to break down between the risk assessment and the risk management process. And by identifying and evaluating management decisions up front in the initial planning phases, stakeholders and risk assessors had more opportunities to gauge in the process and identify priorities. And this is where indigenous and Western researchers started to improve the different processes within this research uh, risk assessment framework. You had a development of tribal exposure factors that reflected intake rates of the tribal people based on their activity and dietary patterns. You had indigenous people identifying the resources that, you, that they utilized that would be threatened by the chemical hazards and also the remedies that are often used to restrict access to natural resources that are contaminated, such as their foods um, and what were commonly known as kind of fish advisories. However, this process does not have a clear roadmap for how indigenous health is incorporated into the dose response component. And this is the point that I think Wendy was trying to make. Health is more than just the absence of disease processes, especially when you're considering indigenous health. And so more attention really does need to be made to this dose response process that's within the framework. So <clears throat> culture is the representative term uh, meant to generally group individuals by customs, social institutions, behaviors, knowledge, beliefs, and norms. Points of culture depicted here, according to Sheehan's respectful, respectful design principles are fluid, often overlapping and applied social norms to understand and cope with environmental demands. We are seeing increased rigid, rigidity in specific cultural points that reject opposition that are too far outside reestablished social norms. For example, neocolonialism or the commodification of the natural world to control or influence is becoming less tolerable among indigenous peoples because it goes against foundational values and beliefs, along with several other points of culture, culture central to indigenous health, like artifacts, ceremonies and customary practices, food and food sovereignty, and oral histories and folklore. The No Dapple or the Dakota Access Pipeline and the Wet'suwet'en resistance battles for protection of indigenous waters and land rights from destructive corporate entities are prime examples of this. For the purposes of this talk, you can also include phrases like acceptable levels of human health risk as equally useless to an indigenous wellness framework. Next slide. Uh, some projects that I have personal experience with that exemplify the unequal understanding of culture and well wellness are those of White Bluffs, plutonium vaults, and the 100K reactor area. After the War Department took over the Hanford site in the 1940s, all inhabitants were given 30 days to remove themselves from the 524 square mile area. 
tribes were only allowed back in over 15 years later to mark their ancestral grave sites and would not again be able to access important traditional sites until the 1980s. Assumptions made on behalf of tribes postponed scheduling and planning remedial actions for sensitive tribal sites to the end of the river corridor contract under which I was employed. As a tribal member, I was able to extend my knowledge of traditional practices into the consultation process. Through equitable communication, my company was able to move these projects to the forefront and move toward a more collaborative planning um, for remediation and to restore these areas for optimal use. It was my great pleasure to see the 100K characterization project through with minimal damage to the burial site and to escort a tribal group to Gable Mountain traditional cultural property in 2013. And that was, hadn't happened since the 80s. Uh, there's another group of uh, Yakima Nation youth visiting the Gable Mountain in the past couple of years, which is the picture provided here below. Next slide. So really kind of the question is, where do we go from here? And this is something that we think about and many of the people on this call are probably thinking about because there is a need to reconcile the systematic issues that contribute to the environmental injustices experienced by indigenous people. And that is kind of codified in this risk assessment approach. And I really wish we had a good answer, <laughs> but I believe that we can point to steps uh, that we can take us further in the right direction, including what Wendy mentioned which is thinking about underlying susceptibility of population level health and specifically whose health we're talking about when we're assessing the toxicological endpoints. But I also think that it requires taking a systems approach towards indigenous health that includes three dimensions, namely the ecological, the human, and the cultural. So we've adapted and in fact kind of adopted this multiple dimension framework that was first proposed by Barbara Harper, Anna Harding, and Stuart Harris, who were the first PIs of the Oregon State Superfund Community Engagement Corps, and have since retired and moved on to different chapters in their lives. They created the traditional substances, exposure scenarios, and risk assessment guidance that would be used by risk assessors to create more inclusive models of Indigenous people. They established intake rates for media and diet that would represent the activities and diets of the Cayuse, Umatilla, and Walla Walla of the Upper Columbia River Plateau. They blended anthropological methodology and exposure science to create reproducible and defensible data for these tribal exposure scenarios, scenarios that have greater intake rates and values for different media and foods that result from traditional practices such as the gathering and consuming of more wild food. And subsequently, the use of these tribal exposure scenarios yield a more conservative health risk estimate, which would require a more stringent cleanup process. So as this methodology has been adapted and evolved, other regions and other tribes have also used this type of uh, ex tribal exposure scenario. So I think this is just a very useful and a practical extension of that red book, silver book framework. But there's also an opportunity to extend this framework further and incorporate aspects of environmental impact assessments and cultural resource reviews. These methodologies exist in anthropology and in natural resource departments, and they're used by federal agencies and tribes. But rarely are all three of these used in combination because of the Western scientific process really puts silos around people, silos around living ecological resources, and silos around archaeological artifacts. And subsequently, these processes, which are so intertwined for tribal people, are fragmented uh, under the risk assessment process, including uh, in federal agencies and even in the universities, which are the training grounds for the scientific experts. So I think this is one way we could begin to include eco-cultural impacts within the dose response step which is in this risk assessment framework, because chemical contamination can degrade the quality of eco-cultural resources and the remedies can restrict access to eco-cultural resources, all of which are detrimental to health and well-being of indigenous people and actually people in general. So the end goal needs to be focused on restoring all three of these systems. And one of the touchstones that I always come back to is when I was talking to a tribal member and they said, look, 
all I want is the information I need to be able to follow my traditional practices as healthfully as possible in the modern world. And I think this is a very pragmatic point of view and something that should be achievable. And the foundation for advancing the systems approach to risk assessment is beginning to fall into place, starting with the EPA passing the Environmental Justice for Tribes and Indigenous People Act in 2014, which has 17 principles, including the incorporation of traditional ecological knowledge during the cleanup process. So one way forward is to think about the human health risk assessment framework is to create strategic implementation teams who have the necessary expertise in the environmental impact assessment, cultural resource reviews, and human health risk assessment who can work together to identify, prioritize, assess, and ultimately manage the risk posed by hazardous waste on tribal lands. And perhaps this will help to address the deficiencies in the dose response step, which currently only reflects toxicological data. However, to do this requires an investment in time, energy, and resources to train and empower both non-tribal and tribal people. Which takes us to the third part of our talk, which is partnering to improve community health. <clears throat> Um, so cultural competency is really on relationships, building relationships and trust. Meaningful consultation requires understanding of what I have started to call square one. It's a place where I have to always return when I meet with new groups, new people, new classes, new professors um, to get, provide the foundation of what my tribal history is and, and my traditional knowledge. So understanding square one is a lot of um, just really getting back to understanding the relationship between tribal nations and their lands, educating the general population on what was in these original agreements under treaty between the government and the tribal nations and where significant gaps have formed and continue to grow. Some things that we have uh, considered here at our super fund to build cultural competence um, are sort of taking on the responsibility of investigating each of our own researcher identity, um, what our motivations are for the work that we're doing, how that affects the way that, that we conduct business, um, and do I consider other value systems or have I had even the opportunity to? So a lot of our um, internal practices are sort of asking, starting to ask these questions. We're also um, going down the road of challenging implicit biases that we all have. We know that we carry those with us. Um, so doing a little more social science to uh, uncover some of those that we carry with us that we may not be aware of. And um, we've also incorporated a few actionable program components to build cultural competency among SRP, the SRP community here. And we can see in these two social media posts, um, these are spreading information about two of those. The, the bottom middle one is the sense of place exchanges that we've uh, started doing with our tribal partners. These are informal gatherings where we can talk about um, a certain topic. In this case, we were invited by our partners to watch the film gather, which is on food systems and food sovereignty among a collection of um, American Indian and Alaska Native peoples. And we uh, had some of the film members um, in a panel discussion afterwards. And then we can bring that back and talk internally with our SRP members. And then the top right is a photograph of our tribal youth campus tour. So we've had uh, four to five, I think, uh, versions of this tour that we sort of modify to include some sort of STEM activity, but they get to meet um, SRP members and learn about the projects that they're working on. And this happens to be the, um, the Sorrel Lab that they're visiting, the Zebrafish Lab. And this is a comment from one of the parents who also went on uh, on the tour. I think this is so awesome, opening your arms to the younger community. So that's that's something that we're trying to get um, a little more informal time spent between the two groups so that we can get come to a better understanding of what meaningful consultation is and who the people are behind those statistics that we're looking at. Um, we also have some upcoming uh, planning efforts around like more, a more formal implicit bias training for the team. Next slide. So it's also important to empower communities and partnerships. And as a university professor, professor I am kind of biased when I think about it in my perch from academia. 
but universities do play an important role as a community gatekeeper and a gatekeeper of what is considered acceptable knowledge. And universities need to work harder to increase diversity in knowledge, science, and practice. We need to have courses that include traditional ecological knowledge and place it on equal footing with Western sciences. And we need to expand the disciplinary boundaries of risk assessment beyond toxicology and engineering. This means having faculty and departments that prioritize these investments. And it means having more Native American, Alaska Natives, and Native Hawaiians in the faculty. Yet these groups have the lowest enrollment in four-year universities. And so this is another investment that we need to prioritize if we really want to move the needle on health disparities and environmental justice. We also need to increase awareness of best practices for partnering with tribal nations and universities need to have knowledge of tribal governance structures in order to establish memorandums of understanding and put those in place in such a way that they respect tribal sovereignty and a tribe's right to restrict access to information that they deem sensitive. There has been a long history of unethical and exploitative science done to tribal people, and we need to reconcile, reconcile this moving forward and build trust. And a good way to build trust is to upend the historical power dynamic. But this can be new territory for organizations, and some people can be scared to give up their positions of power, but you have to realize that you're not giving up, you're actually just sharing it. So some steps in the right direction are training administrators within organizations to create MOUs with tribal nations, and that each research project or study with the tribal nation has a data sharing agreement in place before it starts that spells out the boundaries of the agreement. And a key component of these types of data sharing agreements is that the tribes will own the data that is generated in the study, and they will decide how it gets shared. So this clause actually throws many university legal departments and many PIs for a loop because of feelings about data ownership. But data sharing agreements work and they do build trust. You just need to walk your legal department through the process because it does go against many of the established norms in academia, which also means that universities need to reward interdisciplinary and interorganizational collaborations with tribal nations. It also means having tribal community advisory boards who can guide you through the necessary government to government relationships because each tribe is its own entity and it can be confusing to the outsider. Which gets to the most important thing that all agencies need to work on, which is to increase representation for communities of color in our university systems, in our government structures, and break down disciplinary silos. Um, this is just a recap on the most important ways to create equitable research. Molly covered very nicely the um, sort of power shift that is required or power sharing that's required between groups. And it's not just tribal nations, but it would be all marginalized groups that we've talked about. Um, but tribal nations specific community empowerment and so this goes back to those square one principles that we talked about was respecting Indian tribal self-governance and sovereignty, honoring treaty and other rights, uh, granting Indian tribal governments maximum administrative discretion over their lands and their peoples. And then decolonization methodology, which can sound kind of scary, um, but really that's what, what is what we're talking about here, just summed up in one, um, one area, acknowledging the dis disenfranchised nature of tribal history um, on many fronts, you know, so that history that I provided back up in, in slide two is, um, is very important for people to understand how we got to where we are today. And then undoing colonial oppression um, of those points of culture, like we've given some examples of here today, traditional cultural properties, artifacts, um, and other food, food systems and food sources, especially. And then community building, um, viewing a community with the strengths-based rather than a needs-based approach. So instead of identifying disparities or the, um, the negative health outcomes within a community, you try to incorporate some of their positive and strengths-based approaches that can serve as um, more, a more healthful way of continuing their traditional practices in, in light of the information, the scientific information we're giving them. Explore multiple ways of knowing and walking in the world. This goes back to what we're trying to do with the tribal youth tours and with the um, the exchanges that we're doing. So it's on both both sides, creating that bilateral um, um, exposure to 
each of our areas of the state, for example. So our CTY, our members are about five hours away, but we're trying to create more time that we can spend both on each other's, uh, in each other's spaces. And then interdisciplinary team-based research design, the super fun already is very interdisciplinary, but in sort of a similar fields. So we've seen how um, even in clinical practice, this has been really beneficial to, so that you're treating all levels of wellness in the people and this goes up to the community level also. So interdisciplinary team-based research design, project management and policy making can help create um, a more equitable practices that are, um, that are getting all of the voices and stakeholders involved. Next slide. So with that, thank you for your attention. Uh, we do want to recognize that uh, we are funded by the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences. And with that, I'm going to stop my presentation. Great, we'll be jumping into the Q&A. I'm going to wait for Kara to take over here and uh, remind everybody, feel free to put in your questions in the Q&A feature on Zoom. And we look forward to answering some of those. Yeah, sure. So we had a question from um, someone who has been involved in cleanups, uh, I believe as a community member under uh, SIDWA, Safe Drinking Water Act. And um, I think the, maybe the way I'll frame this question for our panelists is for community members who are concerned about contamination in their areas um, and they are invested in pursuing those concerns, how, what are some ways that, that those community members can get involved given that as you've pointed out, um, academia and, uh, and federal regulatory structures are not always um, easy to navigate for, uh, for community members. All right, I'll, <clears throat> I'll start. I see this is sort of in our backyard, so I'll, I'll start from there. Um, you know, and I think uh, putting this into the perspective perhaps that was raised by both Molly and Sadil, which are these, these sort of these silos, right? Because right here we have a super fun cleanup at a military base. Um, and what we're looking at are a series of contaminants and you raise contaminants of emerging concern. Right, which is a different suite of contaminants and is typically addressed under Superfund. Um, and so I think um, the, the addressing those challenges, right, speak to decoupling these silos, um, but in a practical sense, what can community members do, right, is to contact um, you're the, the people who are working on this in terms of if there are academic institutions working here, contact your legislators, um, open up the conversation with your neighbors. The more people that are available to have this conversation and open it up in the public, the more, I, I would say the more visibility that you potentially have. The challenge, of course, is we are looking at a very uh, sort of ingrained process or a very long established process. And our, the community members with whom we work know that this is a significant challenge. So I would suggest also reaching out to other community members, um, communities, uh, leads who have experienced similar struggles uh, and opening dialogue there because um, it's a real it's a real heavy slog I don't know I don't think that's what the person really wanted to hear but I think that's that's the reality I think it kind of highlights an issue too which is um, even if you want to participate in the process the process itself is somewhat opaque even though it is meant to be transparent and so there is uh, a need to actually learn how to engage in these political processes because they are open forums or they're meant to be open forums. And community engagement is supposed to be part of this process. So some of the places that people could uh, begin to kind of understand where they can intersect with this, Wendy mentioned quite a few, but uh, start with your local state uh, environmental health department. 
So every state has their own, um, but here in Oregon, it's the Department of Environmental Quality, and they will be the ones that are authorized uh, by the EPA to do the remediation uh, on site. They're, for tribes, they're supposed to be tribal liaisons, but for community groups, you know, kind of learning who that is, what department it is, and working your way up through your, your state environmental quality. Uh, department is one way to at least learn where those conversations are happening and start to kind of get engaged. But uh, it really does require a lot of grassroots efforts um, to make the sim to make the process simple, unfortunately. So I, I want to piggyback, I think, on what uh, Molly is saying. And Sadell, I'm sorry to cut in, but my <laughs> it's it's right here right now, and I will absolutely turn it over. I apologize. Um, one thing is that um, we need to also uh, be careful about jumping in and demanding, for example, a health study, because there are pitfalls. And um, I want to point out that uh, actually our BU Superfund um, program, um, actually Madeline Scammell and Greg Howard had developed um, a community guide to health studies. Um, and, uh, and the point is, is that you want to get in and have that conversation with either the state and or the state health department or the state environmental protection program, depending upon which one has the doors open, uh, but to know that process, but um, be wary of being having the door shut um, sort of prematurely. Sadell. I'm not sure if I have much help, but um, from my experience, it's always been who you know, you know, so um, our tribe is very small. So we know uh, what committee and commission to go talk to. Um, like Molly said, like it's often often a real grassroots effort. So there are probably community organizing things happen uh, happening around environmental issues anyway that you could tap into that will know the process. So really it's just getting out there and finding the network of people that are doing that work um, and then sort of inserting, inserting yourself in, into that dialogue. Um, we have another question uh, in the Q&A um, asking about regulatory requirements and uh, the limitations on regulatory agencies imposed by some of those requirements or their absence. And a question asker wants to know whether the panelists see any possibilities for stakeholders to influence how regulations are written to enable this kind of systems approach and enable more explicit environmental justice considerations. Um, I have thoughts on this as well, but I'm very curious to hear about the panelists. <laughs> uh, well, at the, I'll start at the federal level, certainly whenever there is um, a, um, a regulation or a, a change, uh, it will be posted in the federal register. There is opportunity absolutely to comment on that uh, that regulation or that change. Uh, we have a voice, we have an opportunity to be heard. The more the merrier. Those comments aren't addressed individually. They, they are addressed sort of as, as groupings, um, but that is a very powerful mechanism. We saw that being used during this administration on a number of environmental issues. Um, so that is one uh, place that people can be involved. Um, to weigh in on uh, proposed changes uh, at the federal level. Certainly at the state level, there are also very similar opportunities, but you're actually closer to those, uh, to those decision makers. And you actually can have influence in talking with um, regulators and talking with um, writing letters and being present, for example, at legislative hearings and providing information um, relevant to the issue at hand. Yeah, I agree with Wendy. You have to get involved with the process. And sometimes it's easier to get involved at local or at local levels, whether and, and there's a lot of regulation that happens at, at the state level that includes uh, civilians, so non-government you know, non uh, agents in rulemaking process. 
So uh, it's about getting to know who is your environmental health decision makers in your state organizations and learning about the rules advisory commissions. There's always, this is a public process and often the public can nominate themselves or nominate people that they think is, is representative to these rats. And this is one way where you can get in on the ground floor of rulemaking. Um, that happens quite a bit here in, in Oregon. And I think- As, as does here in Massachusetts, right? One uh, thing I am interested in from this standpoint is the implications for English language isolated communities, because as much as uh, regulatory bodies can seek to offer opportunities for public comment and promulgate, you know, or promote those, those opportunities, um, there are, I think, a lot of missed opportunities to involve populations that traditionally are, are often excluded from those processes. I'm hoping that that's one of the things that uh, will be changing. You know, like with COVID, with uh, the protests for racial justice, organizations are starting to examine some of their systematic processes and thinking about how to be more inclusive I think we're right on that knife edge. So I think the question will be, you know, what step agencies take? And uh, I think that's gonna depend on, on where the people push them. <laughs> so keep pushing them to be inclusive, uh, to include diverse voices, to recognize that some of the most impacted people, at least for hazardous waste sites, are marginalized communities and to actually reach out into those communities to form new partnerships so that they're not just kind of sitting in their own echo chambers of the people, you know, the, the roster of the tried and true voices that they know will show up to these committees. It is about kind of taking a risk on both sides um, and trying to engage communities that are impacted because they do have the deep knowledge, but they've also been marginalized. So it's really about trying to recreate and rebalance um, the power dynamics. So we're uh, at the top of the hour, actually, I'm just realizing a couple minutes passed. Um, so uh, I want to um, just share contact information for our speakers today. Um, for uh, any additional questions or concerns or follow ups, um, are, we, we are very, very grateful to our speakers for sharing their expertise today and, uh, and want to provide you with their contact information here as well as more information about their work. And I believe Hannah had some wrap up logistical notes. Yeah, great. Thank you so much, Kara Jin. We are approaching the end of our webinar today. A video recording of this webinar will be available on Shea website soon. Tomorrow you'll receive an email containing a link to the recording as well as the survey that I mentioned. Please take a few minutes to complete the survey so that we can tailor future webinars to your interests. Shea's next generation chemical series webinar will take place this Thursday, December 10th and is titled how chemicals and air pollution are harming fertility, latest evidence and what we can do. You can RSVP through CHE's website at healthandenvironment.org. If you are new to CHE and would like to stay updated about upcoming events or more, please sign up to receive our newsletter by selecting the Join Us tab at the top of any page on our website. Additionally, if you appreciate these CHE partnership webinars bringing you the latest environmental health research for free, we encourage you to support CHE's ongoing work by making a tax deductible donation via our secure website. Again, our website is healthandenvironment.org. With that, I would like to thank our speakers, Dr. Wendy Heiger Bernays, Dr. Molly Kyle, and Dr. Sidel, or Sidel Harris for taking the time to present today, and to Kara Dwin for her excellent moderation. Thank you so much for joining us. Stay well and healthy and have a good day. <laughs>